club. What they usually do is I think they, they take off their shoes, then they cover their feet, their socks and their feet, uh, so they can walk around. But again, shoes should be covered up also because the shoes might have picked up DNA from elsewhere. When you uh, handle different pieces of evidence, change your gloves because the DNA you might have used to pick up or to handle one piece of evidence might get transferred to the other one and we don't want that to happen. So change gloves if you handle two different, different pieces of evidence. It's also important to get controls. The areas uh, like, like near a blood center or saliva contact area, well, that presumably was from the criminal. Uh, we take, we, we take, well, we sample that, but we also want areas near it or away from it to compare. Because if there is a place where we know the criminal did not do the crime, let's say in a different room where we know the criminal did not do the crime, and we find the criminal's DNA there, well, maybe the criminal was there not doing the crime, and maybe he was there legitimately. And he was not, uh, this, the person with the DNA was not the criminal, it was somebody else. Um, so we should know uh, if there's DNA elsewhere, it might you know, add some, uh, some information to the case. So get the DNA from elsewhere. Uh, and uh, so uh, we'd have that kind of information also. Uh, we mentioned this before, this is called substrate control. Not just from the place where you're collecting the evidence, collect it from around because you want to see what it's compared to, where it, where it isn't, as to, as to where it is. We want to compare the two, and we'll get more information that way. Um, if we uh, suspect blood is there, but we don't see it, then we spray luminol over it. This will, uh, and uh, in the dark, this will glow. And even tiny trace amounts of blood will glow with luminol. So we think there's blood there, spray it with luminol. Luminol will, will be able to show you whether there was blood there, even if it was cleaned up. The trace amounts will show up with aluminol. And if there's luminol, it shows that there's blood, then we can take the DNA from there. So that's a very uh, common thing, that we suspect the crime was there, we suspect there was blood, spray luminol, uh, see the luminol, the glowing luminol shows there was blood. If so, then we take samples from there for DNA. The fact is that, very fortunately, luminol um, does not harm DNA. It interacts with the blood, but does not harm DNA cells found there. So, um, the DNA is great. I mean, uh, it's pretty much incontrovertible. You find uh, you find a person's uh, you know, uh, a person's DNA at the crime scene, and you go to the person you get and to match the to the suspects. Um, you pretty much guarantee the suspect was at the crime scene, probably doing the crime. So how you know? So how do you fight this? I mean, this is great evidence. I mean, and DNA evidence is, is is very often deposited because you know people touch things, uh, criminals touch things too. So how in the world is it fought in court? This is very important to know. They don't question the fact that DNA works. They don't question the fact that you have, yes, made a match. They, try, they question the procedure. They question the person. They are the, the trustworthiness of people who collect the evidence, who handle the evidence, who analyze the evidence. This is uh, very clear in the case of the, there was an, a case of Orenthal James Simpson, where his uh, ex-wife, was murdered, was was stabbed to death um, by someone, and they suspected Orenthal James Simpson for killing his ex-wife. And um, uh, you know, at, 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 right, right at his at his ex-wife's house, uh, I think it was in the front in front of it. But anyway, so they suspected him uh, of killing her. Now, the, 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 he this was done with a knife, so there was a lot of blood everywhere, <clears throat> and they so he said he was innocent, of course, and they found the DNA from uh, his ex-wife on his sock. Now, again, they, they, they were not living together. They, they found some of the DNA uh, you know, on items belonging to Orenthal James Simpson. So uh, how could he possibly find How could he say, oh, I was never there if we found the DNA of the, uh, of the, of the, of the victim on him? I mean, it's, a, it's like a smoking gun. Obviously, he was there. The DNA was found on him. So he was rich, and he hired lots of really expensive lawyers. So and he got out of it. He what he did what you know what the, the lawyers did was they they did not deny the DNA evidence that it showed uh, the connection. But what they did was they said uh, someone called Detective Mark Furman. He was the one who uh, was in charge of collecting the evidence. They claimed. That he, uh, Orenthal James Simpson, will happen to be uh, uh, black African American, and they claimed that Mark Furman was a racist and he planted the evidence. 
they couldn't deny uh, the, the the ability of DNA, so they they attacked the person. They attacked Mark Furman. They claimed he was a racist, and he planted it. They uh, I think they also found uh, some problem with the procedure that I think uh, someone kept kept it in 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 her in her laboratory uh, coat pocket, kept the sample there for longer than she should have. I think it was for a, a lot longer than she should have. Now, this doesn't mean the DNA didn't work, but if they can show that the person didn't follow the procedure correctly, then they're going to say the person was, uh, you know, the, the person was an, in, an inept doofus and did terrible things with the with, with thing and, and then just ruined the whole thing. And they, uh, they, um, their uh, their procedure was all wrong, and they did it wrong. And if they found a connection between the the, the, the crime scene DNA and the suspect's DNA, well, they, of course they, they did because uh, they're incompetent. So that's what they do. That's what lawyers try to do. So that's why it's of utmost importance to follow the protocols, do everything as, as the protocol demands. Because if you are told to, uh, let's say, transfer it within five minutes, and you do it within 10 minutes, they're going to say, well, you're inept. That's why the, the, the evidence uh, says that the, the, that, that the person is guilty. But uh, you were messing everything up. That's why you found him guilty. But really, he's innocent. So it's very important throughout the chain of custody to follow the protocol, to, to do everything right, and so that you, you cannot be questioned or... Um, or, or shown to be a fool, or even uh, uh, a racist, or an enemy of, uh, of the defendant, uh, of the suspect, uh, because that's what they will attack. So make sure you are above, you are above this kind of suspicion, because if you're not, that's exactly what they're going to use. So nobody wants to be in that position, so make sure you do it right, follow, follow the protocols correctly, and the DNA will lead to um, the truth and a solution of the case. So here's a little bit of a review, what you need to know uh, about the subject, know about tandem repeat, mini SDRs also, how they use Y chromosome DNA, what it does, um, and why it's useful, mitochondrial DNA, and also a little bit about film, familial DNA, um, how DNA is so valuable, what touch DNA is, also the collection and preservation, and how it's, how it's used and fought with uh, by lawyers in the courts. For a bit of practice, here are homework problems. We have the textbook. Um, go ahead and look at these homework problems to um, cement and to solidify your knowledge of DNA.